Uh, thank you for coming. And uh, you know what? I'll just I'm just going to read a little bit from the story, and then we'll talk. It's a lot like my living room in here. I'm going to read from the first story in the collection. It's called The Climber Room. The sign in the sweet apple kitchen declared it a nut-free zone. And every September, somebody, almost always a dad, cracked the usual stupid joke. The gag, Laura, the school director, told Tova, would either mock the school's concern for potentially lethal legumes, or else suggest that despite the sign's assurance, not everyone at Sweet Apple could boast of sanity. Today, as Tova leaned into the fridge to adjust the lunch bag heap, a skinny gray-haired man in a polo shirt, old enough to be the grandfather of the girl who called him Papa as he nudged her toward the cubbies, winked at Tova, pointed to the sign. Here it came, the annual benediction. Nut free, Papa said. Oh no, guess I'd better scram. He looked at Tova as though expecting some response, but what? Tolerant smile? Snappy retort? Hand job? These older fathers with their second doing it right this time families were the worst. This version stuck out a large knuckly hand that seemed locked in contest for supremacy with his heavy platinum watch. Randy Goat, the man said. Tova figured she had misheard. Tova Gold, she said, and shook his hand, or rather, a few of his supple fingers. And this is Desi. Desi, Tova said, recognized the girl now. She sank to a knee, which was not only the proper way to address children, but a nifty evasive maneuver vis-a-vis -vis their crypto-creepy progenitors. Hi, Desi. Do you remember me? I tagged along with Laura on the home visit a few weeks ago. You showed me your new sparkly shoes. Sparkle shoes, said Desi. Sparkle, of course. Right, Randy said. I was out of town when you guys popped by. The place had been enormous, dizzying, a living, well, not quite living, embodiment, not embodiment precisely, of the aspirational sconce porn that Tova sometimes indulged in online or at magazine racks. We met your wife, Tova said. She was so nice. Tova still blanked on the family name. She was stuck with goat. I remember with my older children, the man said. You guys like to do a little recon, find out if we keep our kids in filth while we boost skag all day. But I guess we passed. We good God-fearing folks, I swears. Tova stared at him, unsure of Laura's preferred reply to such a performance. She was new to the pre-K world and just part-time, temporary. Tova had been an administrative coordinator at an east side prep school for years until the school brought back the retired headmaster to replace her. The crash had made crumb snatchers of the toniest. The headmaster had run the school. Now he ran the office. And Tova, at home, ran a lot of hot water for non-revitalizing soaks. The offer from Sweet Apple, managed through a distant family friend, had saved her. Sorry to shock you, Randy Goat said now. Just funnin'. You didn't shock me, said Tova, though the word skag, the old-timey TV creak of it, intrigued her. A tight ass, Randy Goat said. Good. It means you'll be careful with my kid. Now other children tore past, monogram backpacks jouncing. Laura jogged up in an outfit she'd recently described as business yoga casual. Mr. Gautier, she said. Wonderful. You know to call me Randy, Laura. You look radiant. You must have bloomed with love this summer. Laura blushed. Not quite. Just a fling? Sounds fun. Tova pictured another universe where, without hesitation, she could slap Randy Gautier's smug, maybe once sensual old man mouth. Laura was annoying, but she didn't deserve this spinster baiting, especially from a geezer. Tova wasn't that far from cat ladyhood herself, though she believed, had staked her life on the belief, that everything always changed at the last minute. The right man, or even woman, what did it matter really, would just appear, and for goddamn certain the right baby, which meant any baby within reason. Race or gender didn't matter, but spine on the inside would be nice. Now an unknown force, perhaps the man's shimmering wrist piece, whipped her back through conjectured space-time, far from the cool lavender room where she cradled her perfect newborn. She stood with her hand on Desdemona Godier's silky skull while the girl's father bent down to address her. It's going to be a great day, sweetie. The first of many great days. 
Just do whatever Laura and Tova tell you. The goat man winked at Tova again. Tova treated him to the smile she once bestowed upon the creative writing professor who told her that some people were meant to write poetry and others, like Tova, to treasure it. She'd proved that incontinent toad wrong for a few years anyway. Tova's D'Agostino's card wouldn't beep her the rebate. She feigned a pressing appointment, offered to pay full price for her crackers and sodium-free vegetable broth. The woman at the register looked at Tova as though she'd chucked a diamond brooch into the Hudson. I can just swipe for you, she said, slid an extra card from beneath the cash drawer. Save it for somebody worthy, Tova said. Hey, the woman said, we need the wood. What's that? You didn't die for my sins, lady, so don't go building a cross for yourself. We need the wood. Tova gave a feral grin. By midnight tonight, fueled by soup and crackers, she would have her first verse in years. Thank you, Tova said. You don't even know. I know you need crazy bitch pills, the woman muttered, but Tova, lost in private triumphal noise, did not catch it. By midnight, Tova lay on the couch with a stomach ache. A miniature swordsman flensed her gut with his foil, or so went an intriguing image that had come to her as she puked up the crackers, the soup, and the Chinese entrees she'd ordered after the crackers ran out. She never ate like this. She kept her slim figure with a subsistence diet of iced espressos, store-cut cheese cubes, and a few dry salads a day. But she remembered that back when she really wrote poetry, she ate a lot of greasy food with no gastric regret. The extra weight had just made her voluptuous. She'd been so young. Now she was 36 and in one eating spree had become a vile sack of fat and rot. In her vision of herself, she was not even obese, but more like a bloated carcass gaffed from a lake. There on the couch, her belly flopped over her jeans, the new chin she'd acquired in about five hours, damp and rashy, rank scents curled from her pores and especially from her crotch whenever she tugged at her waistband to ease the ache. It, it was all so awful, evil, so unlike the tova of recent years, of modified appetites and reduced expectations, that her corpse body surged with something revoltingly, smearishly pleasing. She felt slimy, garbage juice sexy. Her hand jerked inside her underwear for relief. She pictured the actual gaffer leaning over the gunwale, rugged, with kind, lustful eyes under a brocaded cap. Sparkle eyes. Tova's legal pad, upon which she'd written only the title of her poem, Needing the Wood, slid to the carpet. Her fountain pen, caught against an embroidered yellow pillow, impaled it. Morning light woke her, but Tova's half-closed eyes bent the rays back into a dream about a sun-stabbed land of which Tova was philosopher queen. She could retain her crown only by mastering a vintage pinball machine set atop an onyx plinth. The flippers stuck, and the holes were the mouths of female poets. A silver ball plopped into the maw of Dickinson. A voice in the head of her dream self told Tova not to skin lip. She woke again, rose from the couch, saw the stained cartons of Kung Pao chicken, sesame chicken, sweet and sour chicken, and mystery mushu. She retched. She took a shower and made gunpowder tea and sat on the toilet. She had a date tonight. I'll just read you the date. This is a fellow that she was in love with for many years and uh, was a legendary guy in his, in his youth. The shock about Sean was his shock of white hair. It looked regal but incongruous with the dark-locked boy she'd known. He stood and seemed to bow as she approached the table a fairly formal gesture for a place that specialized in artisanal scrapple. Sean, she called with cheerful volume, as though to cover for her disappointment in his follicles. Tova, Sean said, awesome. They hugged, and Tova's chin grazed his collarbone. That zap, the hot sweet charge of the party long ago, tingled. She wanted Sean to save her and screw her and give her a baby. After that, maybe he'd have to leave. You look great, Tova said. If that's true, I owe it to the mighty sport of handball. It's an epic workout. You look really good, too, seriously. I never exercise and I rarely eat. It's a winning plan. I think you're meant to be a little heavier, though. You're tall and skinny with big, beautiful bones. Big bones, said Tova. 
totes. I know it's a euphemism for chubby girls, but you just happen to be hot with slightly extra large bones. I always wanted to jump them. That night we talked, that was an epic night. They hadn't even heard the specials and he'd already mentioned their magic moment. Man, he said, what's it been, 20 years? 16. Oh, that's better. How's your sister, Tova asked. I haven't spoken with her in a long time. She's good, I mean evil. She works for this huge rapalicious law firm. Is she still married? Totes. What's totes? Sorry, I work with a lot of young people. I pick up their lingo. Anyway, man, Tova, you do look really good. Was it possible he could be a moron and still be her savior? Where do you work? Right now I'm involved with a new startup, Sean said. It's hard to explain. We make apps for apps, basically. So that pays well? No, not yet. Meantime, I'm working with organic food materials, mostly flour items. Like a muffin shop? Yeah, pretty much. I'm a part-time preschool teacher right now. Sounds epic, Sean said. Little kids? I love kids, said Tova. But the politics? Or could she be the moron? A young waiter arrived without menus and explained the ordering process, which involved a few crucial decisions about sides and beverages, but a surrender of volition in the realm of entrees. Tonight was Thursday, which meant Pennsylvania-style Scrapple. What exactly is Scrapple, Tova asked. It's Mennonite soul food, Sean said. The waiter rolled his eyes. It's everything from the pig except the meat, he said. Organs, hooves, eyelashes, lips. It's all pressed together in a loaf. I personally love it. Sounds kind of trafe, Tova said. Tray trafe, doll face, the waiter said. After dinner, you can join a settlement and redeem yourself. Whoa there, buddy, Sean said. It's okay, I'm a yid, the waiter said. Really, Tova said? Totes, the waiter said. Look, I think I'm going to leave, Tova said. I actually prefer pig eyelashes as a separate dish. Of course, Sean said, let's go. They walked the streets for a while, laughed at the shitty waiter and the perspectival complexity of time. It reminded Tova of those play scenes from eighth grade, lovers by the creek or at the carnival, something about the moon. Now they leaned on a playground fence. Beyond it, in the last of the light, children stalked each other with neon water rifles. Sean looked at Tova, pinched the collar of her shirt. Twenty years later and I still feel attracted to you. Sixteen years, Tova said. I had no idea you liked me. I was so smitten. You were the genius. You were going to do all the wonderful things. Yeah, well, what happened, said Tova. Nothing happened, Sean said. I've had all sorts of adventures, good times, bad times. You know I've had my share. Seriously, Tova said. She must have clawed out of the womb saying that. Seriously, I wasn't measuring myself against a prophecy of me. We were, Tova said. Well, then fuck you, big bones. That's your problem. And what are you doing that's so great? Anybody can play with kids. I'm also a poet. And you have a blog, I'm guessing? I'm sorry, Tova said. You're right. I'm being abrasive. I get scared of intimacy. I flail. That's so cool. Let's start again. No more scrapple. I don't think so, Sean said. Whatever the opposite of compatible is, that's us. Incompatible, Tova said. If you say so, wordsmith. Thing is, we both need the same crap. Somebody with money and security, and also, did I mention money? To shore up our egos? to nurture our unrealistic dreams. Yes, Tova said, that's actually true. That's an insight. Thank you, Sean said, I used to be very promising. Can I ask you something? Are you going to ask whether my hair turned white slowly or overnight? Do you want me to, Tova said? Well, let me tell you a story. I was working on a guide boat out of the Solomon Islands. Sean spoke into the darkness for a while, telling a mesmerizing, no doubt spurious tale Tova realized that she didn't care about him or his saga or the whiteness of his hair one whit. She could never mate with a man who called her big bones, even once, even in jest. She could never expose her eggs to such a jerk. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you all for joining us t this evening. I'm um, delighted to be up here with Sam, who's one of my favorite writers and um, always makes me laugh, as he was doing with all of us just now. Um, Sam's Scrapple? Yeah, Scrapple. Where'd that come from? <laughs> <laughs> I've always loved the word, and then eventually I found out exactly what it was, and I, I couldn't resist putting it in there. Um, so, <laughs> but I do have a, a, a friend who, a Mennonite friend who described the various kinds to me, so. 
Is it actually a Mennonite dish? Yeah. Oh, okay. Wow. All right. I'm um, just trying to bring you all the information. <laughs> <laughs> it's very educational here. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, so tell us, um, you know, I, I think, Sam, you're often described as the kind of the poet of losers. The, 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 this, New York this New York Magazine profile just now kind of said how you always, you're capturing the kind of the, the under, the sort of the, the underside of American life and all that. And I, I wonder, how, how, do you, how do you feel about that? How do you respond to that? I'm not sure it's entirely fair, but I'm curious for your, your reaction. Yeah, I mean, I, I bristle sometimes because I, I don't sit down and say, I'm going to write about losers today. <laughs> I'm just, I'm writing about, you know, me and people I know. So uh, I feel as though, you know, who are the winners, really, is, what is my question. And there are very few of them. Um, some people call them the 1% but, uh, or the 10% or whatever it's going to be. You, you but this idea that, you know, there are, there are all these winners and then some losers doesn't really jibe with what I, what I see going on or what I've experienced. No, a lot of the winners seem like losers when you get up close. Well, that's true too, but I, you know, I just see my characters as people that often have a lot of problems and are struggling and uh, make bad choices, but uh, I don't know, I just I don't, I don't see them as losers, at least as, as I conceive of it. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, but I wonder if maybe, do you think, I think sometimes with... Um, you know, in fiction, we're sort of afraid of being too honest about all... You know, I mean, in the sense that other people write about people down on their luck and all that, but you give it in such uh, kind of cringe-inducing cringe, cringe -inducing detail sometimes, like, like we were just hearing. Um, and I wonder if maybe some, sort of it's that, that hunt for that detail of that, that the, the sort of the particular of someone's situation that, that kind of makes it... Um, yeah, I think that gives it life. Uh, and also, yeah. I don't... I, feel with all of the characters and everybody I know, we're all, at certain points we're victims and at certain points we're victimizers. I mean, it's just, as we conduct ourselves in our lives, we're, you know, we're getting treated badly here and we're doing something shitty over there and it's just, um, and then we're trying to not do that and we're trying to make it better and in making it better we screw up something else over here and uh, it's, you know, we're just, we're all trying to figure this stuff out and mm -hmm. that, and so I, I'm, you know, I put my characters in situations that will present uh, some conflict, both exterior and interior, and, mm. uh, and put pressure on them, because you know, that, that's what creates uh, the, the drama or tension in the work. I guess it's kind of what you're trying to do a bit with the, the Empathy Circle, which is a, a, a new story in this new, new collection. Oh yeah, the Republic of Empathy. Republic of Empathy, sorry, yeah. But the circle of sort of empathy. I mean, sort of the characters yeah. kind of circling, and each each one in their place is right. kind of um, ending up as in a different position than they were. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of more schematic in that story, but right. um, yeah, I think it's something that operates in a lot of them. Um, and have you always been? So this new collection, I think, I'm not sure if everyone's read it yet, but is is just just short stories written over the last decade, fifteen. Well, most of them have been written in the last three or four years, okay. and then there are a few outliers that were written earlier. Okay. And um, I guess from the m moment I finished my last novel, I, I was really uh, pouring myself into short stories again. My first book was a collection of short stories, and mm -hmm. I just I wanted to get back to the form and see what it felt like now for me. And how does it feel? Well, now I'm ready to get away from them again, <laughs> but um, <laughs> at the time it, it was... Uh, it was a lot of fun. Mm. And did you feel a little bit freer with short stories? You can test, you can test ideas out. I mean, you, I well, I mean, what's great about them is you know you can write a lot, and most of them are terrible, and you can toss them, um, where, as opposed to working years on a on a book and then a novel and then realizing that it's it's not going to work. So there, that's that's definitely a, a freedom. Mm. I mean, you could sense reading these that you're having a bit of fun. You're sort of these. You kind of have these ideas. Maybe you're not having fun when you're writing comes across that way. You're kind of testing out. There's some idea that you've come up with. Maybe it's about empathy or it's about um, Dungeons and Dragons or something like that. And you're kind of pushing it and seeing how you can, how you can make it work. Yeah, they all, they all kind of come from different places. And the funny, the Dungeons and Dragons story, that, the one in the book I wrote a couple of years ago, but I, I tried to write that story 20 years ago. And... Uh, and I couldn't do it, and I wasn't ready to write it, and I didn't have the right perspective on it, and um, I couldn't—I just couldn't get it. And I just 
forgot about it. And then I just start, I started writing about those characters again, and and I realized as I was in the first couple sentences, oh, this is that story that I could never write. And and, and, it had and this time it came. They well, it had the same uh, setting and the same characters, but not the same things, ha not the same sentences. Right, right. And it, were you a big Dungeons and Dragons? No, I mean, I, when you were a kid. No, or? I mean, I, now I'm being accused of being a poser, <laughs> pretending that I was <laughs> this big D and D player. Um, Did you get some of the some of the characters wrong or something? I must have, you know, the pa the paladin yeah, with the, you know. gotten some, yeah. Something wrong about an elf or something, and uh, s but because I have been attacked in certain quarters for that story, but um, I did play a lot, and it w at a certain, and that's what the story's about. Just a certain moment in my life when I was playing a lot with some other people, and we were all kind of going through some, you know, serious emotional stuff, and kind of it was it was a very intense, weird time, and that that's really what the story's about. The the game is just a way to tell the story. And, and also a way for the, I mean, because I think people often see it as an escape, but in fact, you're not escaping from anything when you're playing this game. Well, in this story, the Dungeon Master uh, is a guy who believes that the game should mirror uh, everyday life and should be as kind of painful and frustrating as everyday life and not be an escapist uh, space where you can fly around on dragons and feel powerful and so forth. So um, these, guys, these kids playing, you know, they, their characters you know, fall down and hit their head on the corner of a table and die. And um, that's the kind of stuff that happens to them. And, and so it kind of builds, builds from that pain into, starts to leak into their real lives a little bit. Um, the other thing I think is fun and amazing is that you, you write about sex um, actually quite well, I think, in the sense that you write about its awkwardness and, its, and there's a lot of bad sex in your books and kind of honest sex and uh, in a way that uh, you don't often read in fiction either. It's this kind of full of sort of really bad euphemism, the kind of thing that wins bad sex awards in England, um, or it's or it's sort of not even described at all and just kind of skipped over or something. But it's sort of I'm I'm sort of admiring your honesty, your kind of willingness to kind of t tackle um, tackle that. What? Yeah. Whoa. There's no <laughs> question there. It's praise. Just <laughs> making praise on you, Sam. Um, no, but I'm curious about I'm curious about that. What, why Why do you sort of you know? Why, I mean, I, uh, why do I advertise how bad in bed I am? Yeah. Is that <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, here, right? <laughs> I, uh, I don't, I mean, I think that uh, I, part of it is that I write often in the first person and, you know, who wants to read a, a first person account of a guy who thinks he's great uh, at having sex? Except for the guy. <laughs> Except for the guy. But, um, so, you know, I'm, I, I'm more interested in the way it draws out aspects of the characters having sex and, and um, then I am in, I mean, we know what the act is, so uh, coming up with a metaphor for somebody's skin or doesn't seem that interesting to me. But um, seeing the ways that uh, we behave in those situations and the ways that um, it brings out parts of us that don't come out necessarily other ways, it's, uh, in other manners, is, uh, is always fascinating, so. And um, it's, you know, like anything else, you want, if it's great sex, there's not really much of a conflict going on there, you know, um, and you're always looking for some kind of drama. I think I don't I, feel all embarrassed. Or <laughs> 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 I, think, I think there's interesting, because there's kind of an interesting parallel with, with food in your, in your stories as well, in the sense that I think very few people write about, when you read about food, it's often some kind of amazing meal, and here it's, you know, your character is falling asleep with with sort of chicken staining her 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 cheeks or something. You're kind of waking up and, and sort of, which you know hap has happened to all of us. And so I, I wonder, it's sort of like you're sort of you're not afraid of the the body, are you? Of of, of the kind of no, I mean we all fail, no, I we? you know, and um, I think I think a lot of it has to do with that. I needed glasses for a long time, and. Uh, <laughs> So I really could only see things close up clearly, and so my work began to focus on that. You, your parents want to get you glasses, or no? I just didn't realize I I needed them, and I never really complained until, you know, I realized it as an adult. Oh, I really need glasses. So you live life, sort yeah. Of everything was very very much like that. So I think that maybe affected some of my themes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, no. I think the body is the body, and you know, is is certainly worth writing about. Mm. Your last uh, novel, The Ask, um, captured, I think, in this 
rather remarkable way because you started writing it, I assume, before the kind of recession yeah. hit. Um, but it kind of it felt very much of our time. Um, maybe, just, maybe just want to just refresh everyone on, on, on the sort of the, the, the brief, the brief story. Well, it's about a guy who works in uh, the development office of uh, of a university, it's in his his domain is raising money for the for the arts at the university, and uh, he's really bad at it, and he he loses his job, and then he's given a chance to win it back, but. Um, because he's been at, he's been requested by a potential donor to be the the the, the guy who brings in brings in the uh, the money and uh, or to be the guy that courts the donor and uh, it turned the donor turns out to be this one one of his best friends from college who's enormously wealthy and sort of so it's kind of a study in humiliation. Um, which, but I, which can be said about most of your work. I said I think. maybe yeah, <laughs> but. Uh, he uh, so yeah no it, it doesn't sound that like that doesn't sound like a good book the way I the way I just described. It's a great book. It's about it. this guy who <laughs> just really wants to find this white whale. He's just uh, there. We go. Yeah. There we go. The white whale. <laughs> yeah. Um. So uh, anyway, yeah. Uh, so I started writing that, and then it was really just about. I mean, I noticed my friends, maybe as a precursor to the larger crash, I noticed a lot of people just kind of uh, having having problems at work and in terms of you know downsizing and all of that and so it was initially more more about that and then the you know all this other stuff happened and so the book seemed to resonate a little you know with mm -hmm. a wider mm -hmm. a wider audience and do your to tie into that i mean again throughout these stories there's this kind of question of money people sort of finding themselves down on their luck without money, or often even better, sort of finding like some roommate or some someone from their past who's actually done done really well. And I'm curious, is that because obviously you know you're a successful writer and 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 teacher and and all that. And so I'm wondering, is, is this do you is this kind of looking back at friends from college and you kind of amused by the sort of juxtapositions between people in your life from the past who've kind of had this change and well, I mean, I haven't if. Let me put it this way: uh, a lot of my work has always has been engaged with questions of of money, of the dynamics between people who have different resources, and also a lot of the work has uh, talked about people's relation to institutions. Whether it's mm -hmm. you know, I wrote a novel that was kind of about the medical industrial complex a little bit, and this was about the um, fundraising world and and a university and so there's and home a book I wrote called Homeland was a kind of about the high school or a guy's memories of high school um so I'm always interested in in that and um I you know I I spent a lot of time you know not being that successful and not having a, not even having you know steady work and so I watched friends of mine kind of gather wealth or or just do really well and um so i think some of that stuff is is autobi autobiographical and some of it is more stolen from friends and mm. other people mm. um maybe we could talk a little bit about autobiography because you, you you um quite famously were you were in a you were in a, a punk band noise yeah. punk band noise band some kind of Racket making, however you want to call it. Yeah, <laughs> Dung I was yeah. curious if you have any thoughts about. It. I was kind of amused to this show's opened at, at the Met on punk. Yeah, I read about that. Punk couture, you know, and I, I was just kind of. I, th I thought that was just sort of a very, you know, here we go. We've kind of come full, we've come full circle now. You know, punk has gone from being this kind of, this sort of underground, this this rebellion, and now it's being feted by Anna, Anna Winter. Um, I, I don't know. It seems like like a, a Sam Lipsight character would have something, uh, something to say about about that. I think some of them have, but <laughs> <laughs> have to go back. Uh, I'd say that it's a process that's been going on for a long time, yeah. and I think happens to, um, to to lots of musical forms. You know, they end up being curated. Uh, I mean, if you think about even jazz, what it, what it was versus, you know, it's still there, and it's people play it and people love it, but it's. Um, it's not the certainly not a re the rebellious form. It was. It was. So I, I, you know, I, it seems pretty typical. What you know, what's going on with, with 
punk, but it's been a long process. I mean, it was sort of became, or m much earlier, it became kind of divorced from any uh, political political meaning or, yeah. And you were, you were in the early 90s? You were yeah, and like even when I was playing, like we weren't trying to be a punk band like the Sex Pistols because that seemed already commodified or something like that. So, you know, it was always a scramble to uh, to s to sort of evade being swept up in in some in some kind of commercialization of of the f of what you were doing. And, and I mean, we we weren't that good, so it was kind of easy to avoid being swept up. But uh, <laughs> if you're good, that that can be a problem. That's the hard part. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Um, well, I was curious, sort of, what you think when you sit down to write. What's your kind of your fictional mission, which was, I mean, you have a character in one of these new stories that writes about all, all the strangeness in the world. And I thought that was sort of a good, maybe a good motto for, for you, that you're, what you're trying to capture, all the strangeness we see around us. The strangeness that is every day and is constant and is, is it sort of so strange that it's, it's so ubiquitous that it's kind of ordinary, but I, I'm, I'm curious about. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't really sit down with a big mission. I mean, I, each piece starts to, shape itself and make its demands and I'm writing a first draft to figure out what I'm writing and then I'm writing uh, drafts after that to, to, to understand even more what I'm writing and then maybe I'll, I'll get a sense, a better thematic sense and I can make things kind of come together and, and, um, and work in an aesthetic manner. But um, no, in the beginning I'm trying to figure out what I'm thinking about and, uh, and I think that I always, when I go come to some kind of fork, and it's this is what I this is what is the expected mm -hmm. uh, way to go, and and here's something that I haven't seen anybody playing with. I'll try to go with the thing that I haven't seen anybody playing with, um, just because it's it's more entertaining when you're sitting at home doing it. <laughs> uh, so, and I guess I don't know. Someone told me that they like the stories because they don't necessarily tuck you in at the end mm -hmm. and um, I think that's I liked hearing that just because I, I couldn't quite find the language for how I felt but that that was it so um, no, there's certainly there's no neat neat endings well right well they might be neat they, they might wrap up but in a horrible way yeah. you know um, so I guess I guess that's what I'm usually just driving at I'm not trying to be strange on purpose but I kind of get interested in things that I haven't read about. I'm trying to, you know, really you're just trying to write something you'd like to read. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and you don't know what that is until you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And you don't know what you're going to say until you say it. And all, like, in all my experience, all I know is if I, whatever I think of beforehand, it's, it, it's nowhere near as interesting as what comes out when I'm actually writing. So anything I, I assemble, you know, beforehand or take notes on is, you know, these will be the themes and uh, of the story, and these, and this is what will happen. You know, that stuff, that stuff, it, it can help you get going, but it, it really is is not what what you're gonna get. It's not the the level you're gonna get to if you just follow your sentences and and see see what unravels. See what they bring you. Yeah. 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 Has teaching changed how you how you write? You've been a teacher now for how many years? Well, I guess I've been teaching in some way. About eleven or twelve years. So you're full time at Columbia. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Has it changed? How, how you how you're writing yourself? I mean, do you find that you're as you're instructing students to be? To no, I don't think it's changed how I write, but it's helped me. It really helps me refine my my thoughts about wh how I do things and why I do things, and um, and it's also you can get inspired by the students writing, or you can see mistakes that. You, that you sometimes make in the studio, it really helps to, to be able, I mean, I, I think that that's why a workshop is very effective because it's not about what people say about your work, it's, it's the other work in the, in the group. Uh, if, you re if you really pay attention to it, uh, you, you really begin to see things that you do and bad or good, but uh, it really does, it, it does help you refine your sense of what, of what you're trying to do. Mm. Um, and do you, yeah, I guess the other thing I've always been struck by with your, with your work is um, adolescence. So it's just something that I think very few writers 
actually kind of write about in an interesting way. And I'm curious, are you, do you sort of feel like you're, why are you drawn to that? What, what, what brings you to write about adolescence? And, and I'm worried for your, your children as they become adolescents themselves because they've got a father who understands it so well. Yeah, I mean, I think that's when I'll be most useful, probably. <laughs> but, um, I, uh, it's when I, I remember it very clearly. I don't remember a lot that went before. I'm, I don't have, a, st strangely, I mean, I have a, a, a sensual memory of, of life before adolescence. But, um, and, you know, I, I have memories of things that I did and places I was. But um, for, you know, probably hormonal reasons, I remember that period quite quite well and um you know it, i feel like certain you know it was f formation of certain ideas about myself or the the in and certain you know the opening of certain wounds that you know we still we're still dealing with in other terms but uh it just it it for me it, it's it feels very vivid and um not in a oh i i st i want to go back there and uh, right wrongs or I you know that's that's the play that's the place I was the happiest it's just it's a vivid memory and I, I also have vivid memories of my later teens and you know just certain po and in my certain times in my 20s I just have these very distinct pockets where things are quite vivid and then other other times where things are, feel a little blurrier and I guess I tend to go to places where um, I have that that clarity and so and I you know I don't really write stories from the uh, POV of small children, for example. Um, although I, ha I have a few times, it's not really, and some people are wonderful at that because they're so suffused with that feeling of childhood and they remember that. And I think we all have very differing uh, time frames where, where we really kind of, uh, we felt in new and intense ways. Mm. Yeah, I guess you, you kind of cut off Around what? How old are the, the boys in um, Dun the Dungeons and Dragons story? Are sort of yeah, like thirteen or fourteen. Yeah, so like that's that. sort of maybe your cut off. Yeah, um, yeah, but uh, but I, 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 it's interesting because I, I just don't, I just find that it's just not obviously for other writers that adolescence doesn't doesn't ring as strongly, um, and adolescence also gives you that chance to sort of talk about all these things that you talk about so well, like the sex and the food and the and these kinds of topics, which you know maybe aren't as obviously aren't important when you're younger. Uh, and maybe you, you, you figure out by the time you're, you know, 30 in some ways or something. Yeah, I mean, well, I'm sure that there are a lot of young adult writers who really are good writing about that that time. Hmm. Um, but maybe maybe some other writers don't. I, I don't know. What kind of uh, advice do you give your, your students when, when they're writing? I mean, are, are you a very... Um didactic teacher or are you are you quite are you quite <laughs> <laughs> i'm pretty didactic yeah <laughs> i feel pretty didactic tonight actually but um uh no i'm trying to i i i guess mostly i just want to figure out what they're trying to do and and it's all case by case but i also reserve the right to say well what you're trying to do is kind of stupid because of you know th because there's this was already written and here's here it is somebody did this so well maybe you need to turn it slightly different way um or given where we are do we really need to be doing that and and if the student says yes i really need to be doing that then i will that's say that's great okay here are some ideas about how to make it better mm. um i think it's kind of like the title of the book but uh a teacher of mine said you know once said the biggest one of the biggest problems is you want to really set everything up and you, so you feel you have to lay out all of this information and you think I just have to get through this part and then I can get to the good part um, you know I know this is boring I mean I have students in class who say well you have to read this chapter I know it's really boring you know but there's no other way it's just a boring chapter and then the next one's gonna really be where things things happen and uh, and the, even the and the language even gets exciting but not here and um, and I, the idea is it all has to be the good part. There's no getting to the good part. And even if you have to set up all of this information, great. You have to find a way to make it wonderful to read. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's that's really I mean the sign of a of a good writer I think is you can open up that person's book on any page and you don't you're not going to know what's going on, but you're going to feel a charge. There's going to be an excitement there. Some you, you feel something's going on. It's going to make you want to go to the first page. 
Um, and it's hard to manage. Like it's you write a long novel, it's hard to manage every page, every sentence. But you should try. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what I tell my students. I think it's often why a short story can feel much more alive than a novel, because in the sense that every I think you're much more aware of that every word, every sentence has to be yeah. fun, has to work. But I and I but I think in the novel, you, you, it's yeah, it's it's near impossible, but you you still have to try a little bit and. Um, and the novel has different rhythms, and sometimes it slows, and sometimes it speeds up, and and we all we all know that. And sometimes it does things that we didn't think of before, and those are those are really good, good reading experiences as well. But uh, there has to be something on every page that's um, like like no other thing. Your your, your friend uh, Lauren Stein, the editor of the Paris Reviews, said one point that that um, there's a whole kind of New generation of writers who have sort of sprinkling of Sam in their in their work, and I'm wondering, have you found uh, some of your students now are kind of reflecting on what what you've written, and and sort of we're seeing, I think he called Kudzu or something like that. Yeah, I try to squash them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't need the competition. You know, they're they're younger and better looking, and they're going to get better deals. So, no, um, I don't know if you know. It, I went through so many phases of trying to be the writers I, I liked and, um, you know, certainly mimicked several writers for, you know, different periods of time until I, I, you come out of it and then you figure out who you are. And part of who you are as a writer, part of your style is, this is everything you've read that you've loved. I mean, that's part, that, that's part of your style. And it's everything, you know, you've... Uh, also experienced as a person and, and it all comes together and that, you know, that's who you are, is, is your style. And so, of, you know, it's like playing an instrument. You know, you start listening to this, say it's a guitarist, and you play like that person for a while, and then you realize you're not that person, and you'll say, but then you start playing like somebody else, and then eventually you figure out where you fit in all of that, you know? Um, and so I don't, I, don't, I don't mind it if, when that happens. Was there a moment when you felt in your own writing that you had kind of broken free from... Some of those influences, or, or, or the overwhelmingness of those influences. Yeah, I mean, I think it was. I think everything up until the the first story in my first collection, okay, I was kind of under the weight of of something or somebody. Which is why it's not published now. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Thank God there was no internet because um, th then that stuff is just buried now. But I probably, if I if I'd grown up in another age, I might have put that online and. <laughs> on your blog or yeah, something. Yeah, and so... Your Tumblr, yeah. I mean, well, that's the other thing, is I, I think about all of the kind of half-assed literary opinions that, you know, my, my friends and I had, and, you know, but you'd be sitting around the table with some beer and saying really stupid shit sometimes because you're just trying to pump yourself up, you know. DeLillo sucks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that. <laughs> that... Um, that had no basis uh, in reality, but it was just you know something you'd say. But you know, a few years later, that could be in someone that could be in your in your blog. And right. It's just a different. You still do that, Sam? Don't you? I've, I've heard you at parties. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, speaking of Delillo, but um, what, give us some some. Do I have to be clear about this? Yes. He's a great writer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Let's, let's turn. Let's turn. To the, but um, are there, wh who are some other other writers um, that you? you really admire today? Maybe some less well-known writers, just for, for everyone here. Um, well, I, a lot of the big writers, but then also, you know, one of my favorite writers was a guy named Stanley Elkin, um, a great comic writer uh, from the 60s and 70s. And I mean, I w I'm not even going to call him a comic writer because I get mad when I get pushed into that corner. So, right. and here I am doing that to him. He was just a, a brilliant novelist. Um, who was funny? Who was very funny? Um, and uh, you know, I, I was really overwhelmed by the, the Barry Hanna sh short stories and um, and like and Grace Paley short stories and. Uh, um, and then, and then other writers, you know, when I was younger, I, I, I still do, but Robert Stone was mm -hmm. a writer I liked a lot, but also 
Uh, the Man Without Qualities was a book that kind of took my head off, as they say, um, just as kind of genius satire. Um, I don't know. There, there are a lot of Leonard Michaels, Gilbert Sorrentino, mm -hmm. like a, a whole gamut. Uh, and then Bartholomew and Pynchon, and you know, it was just a. It was just yeah. I'm naming people that everybody knows, but uh, did, did did you feel when you were coming up that it was much more vibrant? There's a lot more styles of writing being being produced than being published. There's a, a bigger conversation in kind of American literature. I, you know, I don't know. It feels that way, but I maybe it just feels that way because you're young and things things seem bigger and um, and it's and it's not you know and. As you get older, things feel smaller. But um, I do sense that there was a time when uh, people talked about books in a kind of more casual and more intense way hmm. than they do now. Now it's a, probably a cable series that they have that conversation about. Uh, but uh, I don't, and I don't think, and if it is a book, it's one book or two books mm -hmm. uh, rather than 10 or 15 books in a year. And even then, it's usually a kind of soft, soft court porn or something like like Fifty Shades. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, but I'm even talking about just having a serious discussion about something. But yeah, that's a. There are always marketing phenomenons. There are always. I mean, there have always, you go if you go. I mean, this is something people have always said. But if you go back and look at the bestseller lists from years gone by, it's a lot of it's trash, you know. Most of it. And um, so it's the the books that we you know consider great now were often uh swept under the rug in their in their time and uh you know i have these old magazines like the american mercury or old harpers and and you know there'll be the review of the of the new faulkner novel and i'll just say you know someday he may write a decent book but you know <laughs> <laughs> and because those are the, these these writers are his contemporaries and they don't know he's faulkner you right. know right. they just you know they're just teeing off on some novel, so um, it's 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 interesting. It's also you don't know what's what's going to last. The, the fear is that you know, as we go on, nothing will last. But you know, it's silly to think about that. It's just I'm I'm writing now because uh, well, for I'm writing because I I love to do it, and I and I hope that. Uh, some people living now are getting some enjoyment out of it. That's I think m many of us are, yeah. Um, and what's next, a new novel? Yeah, I'm in that kind of, I always say I hate writing and love rewriting, and so I'm in that first draft, like what the hell is this stage of what could be a novel? I, I won't ask any, any further. Well, you better not. <laughs> <laughs> um, any, any questions? From Thanks. Yeah, I don't. It's a really good question. I there's a. I recently was hearing this composer talk, and he said someone asked who, do, who he thought his audience was, and he said, anybody born after 1973, which seemed pretty arbitrary. Um, I I identify, and I think it's maybe because I grew up with some kind of literary ideas and and wanting to to write that I I tend to identify with the with m with my generation and older um in a lot of the ways I think about things and I do 
I do see, and I, and I feel that, I guess what I feel is that a lot of, a lot of us felt responsible uh, about knowing the, just the previous 50 years before we were born, just history, just the basic points, but you know, how we got here to this moment. Um, and I, I don't sense that as much. I guess that, that's it. I think that because there's so much more information uh, load is, is, is so much larger now to ingest for younger people, or at least they're subjecting themselves to that. They're, they're, they're embracing that. That um, there's, there's kind of less sort of shared knowledge about what things, what things were like 10, 20, 30, 40 years before. I find that interesting. So I don't, I do think that, you know, it's very easy to, to say the kids today. Um, and you're, 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 in every generation that says that is right and wrong. And every generation will say that. And so um, you're gonna be right about some things, but um, there, is, there is a kind of radical shift, I think, um, because of technology and other things, but um, what 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 I don't know is, you know, th I think I was the tail end of something that lasted a long time, you know, including the long boom or whatever you want to call it, uh, and so things things shifted for younger people, and uh, you know they're not necessarily living in the superpower that uh, that people took for granted, uh, and it's a very it's a it's a much more complicated landscape for them. So, uh, and I think, but I think they're if they're still interested in, in using imaginative writing and using language to, to tackle that stuff, I, I think there's gonna be some great writing. And I see it, I see it from, from younger people all the time. Um, the middle. <laughs> That's a kind of general answer, but uh, that kind of lost place where you know you began well, and you took some turns, and and now you're not so sure. And should you have faith and go on? What if it's total shit? Um, or should you give it up? What if you were really onto something? And uh, that kind of confusion is can be really difficult. I. Uh, and then sometimes it's you do I with the ask I wrote 200 pages of that book and threw it out and um, and started again and it was the best thing I could have done, but that's not always the solution. So that that place where you're kind of before the the middle hump, I guess, when you really may, you're really wondering if you went down the right road and you're not going to find out for many more miles if you keep going. That that to me is very difficult. Yeah. Well, I guess when I was younger, I was, you know, good enough to get pats on the head from the teacher. Oh, you're so creative, kind of stuff, and um, believed it, you know. And and th and then uh, in my in my teenage years, really, you know, started to write, discovered short stories like modern short stories, neat stories in the New Yorker, things like that, and started to write, you know, you know, I was 16 and writing stories about divorced men in their 50s and stuff like that. And um, <laughs> I had no idea, you know, what I was talking about, but uh, was trying to kind of mimic some melancholy feeling that I'd picked up. Um, and, uh, and, but people seem to, you know, it's, you know, it's like a, you're good for a kid, like, oh, that's, that's so nice, you know. Uh, then I went through a period when I realized that I was just full of shit and, um, and that I was just relying on a couple of ticks that I'd picked up somewhere and that when it really came to it, I, you know, I didn't know anything. And then I kind of stripped myself down and, um, and, then, and then I was really trying a lot of different approaches and I was really bad for a long time and, 
everything was just too mannered or too loose or whatever. I just was all over the place. And, um, and I remember writing a story that was, I mentioned before, it was called Old Soul, but it was a story in, in my first collection. And I remember just, it's, I started writing and I just had that feeling of, oh, this is writing. Um, this is what it feels like. And it was, it was this kind of wonderful sense that everything was just, as I wrote, falling into place in front of me as I went. And, um, and of course, you know, I never got that feeling back again, but um, I had, or I had to work for it way more than that one single time. But that, that to me was a breakthrough because I, I just was feeling, this is me, this is how I write sentences. This is, you know, whether it's that good or not, it just felt like, this is what I do. Um, this is how I do it. And um, that to me was a, was a pretty serious moment. Um, you know, it was that feeling of, for better or for worse, this is, this is me. Yeah. No, it, I feel like it had to come from me. I, you know, I'd had people tell me I was, you know, clever and good job and here's a ribbon, you know, as a schoolboy and stuff like that. So that didn't, that didn't, it, it was felt good, but it, it always felt somehow false too. It had to, it had to be a feeling of just, oh, this is what I, this is how I want to do it. This is how I do it, you know. So, yeah. But it took a long time, it took a while. Thanks.